thank him. We will turn over to what God has laid on your heart for us. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Pastor Bowers, and thank you, Jesus. This is... Um, it's a gift to be able to share this space with you all. As the last time I was here, I spoke in that building where um, God had you gather in a smaller space. It, this is amazing. It truly is. It's the first time I've seen it. It's amazing. And I pray this morning that you receive his message through me, his truth, his grace. I am just a vessel, and I have surrendered my story to him, the author and finisher of our faith. I know that when I was here last time, I did share some of my life. Today I'm going to use some of my life as an example of what Paul was talking about in Corinth. If you're following along in the one-year New Testament Bible, we're in 1 Corinthians. And I just want to take a minute to talk about the town, or the city, of Corinth. It was um, southwestern, southwest of Greece, those of you who are geography buffs. I am not. Um, and if I can say this next word right, Corinth was on an isthmus, I, don't ask me to say that again, <laughs> a piece of land jutting out into the sea. So because of its location, it was a trading hotspot. Of course, in those days, a lot of the things came by boat. And so you had lots of foreigners coming to Corinth. And originally, Greek had, um, Greece had settled there, but it, the Romans took it over in 146 BC. So just think about this a minute. This town, Corinth, was known for its sin. It had all kinds of religious variety. Some worshipped Greek gods and goddesses. Some had the Roman religion, very strict. Others, as we heard in the reading from Steve this morning, were worshipping heroes, local people. And can you imagine the Apostle Paul and his challenge to write snail mail to these people to encourage them with, to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Who at the time when Paul was writing to them, Jesus had already done his ministry, already died and risen. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you can relate to being in a town or a city like Corinth, but I can. Forty years I did life by myself, for myself. Forty years I did life in what felt good, in, you know, because the devil makes sure that sin feels good. The devil makes sure that sin is attractive in some way. And so, when I arrived to the door of Christianity, I first believed God is real, and I began coming to church sometimes, but I was still a slave to sin. There was so much baggage that I carried. Yes, some of it was heavy. The shame of things I knew better. That was heavy. But there were lots of things I didn't know I was doing wrong in the eyes of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how <laughs> How did I get here? This is nine years later from when I first walked in the door of Christianity. How did I get here for the second time at 
this church. How does God put someone like that in front of people to share his truth and his message? Friends, only by his grace, only by his chain-breaking grace, only by his cleansing grace, do I stand in front of you today? And I believe that when, <clears throat> excuse me, I was here before, this was probably two or three years ago, I was celebrating a newfound freedom. When my chains were broken, I was celebrating a newfound freedom, but we're going to get back to that. Because the process of unpacking the baggage that we all carry was not quick and it took my attention to stay with God because he is patient because he is forgiving because he walks faithfully with us whether we know right or wrong or not he helped me unpack what I sometimes refer to as my suitcase of sin that I carried around for 40 years. <clears throat> well, there were things that I didn't expect to find. The first thing he called me out on was alcohol. Oh, I knew my parents had a problem with alcohol. I didn't think that I did. The next thing he showed me was this perfectionism thing that I had, um, hmm, is it in and of itself bad to want to be perfect? Ooh, it is a direct offense to God, who is the only perfect one. And I was in this cycle of seeking perfection in my relationship, seeking the perfect day, seeking the perfect mood, the seek seeking the perfect marriage, being the perfectly looking person. I was a mess. And as we, you know, as I walked, and as I learned, and as I prayed, and as I grew closer to God, he showed me one day about pride. I can remember the sermon that I was listening to, and the pastor that day was talking about pride as one of the seven deadly sins. Ooh, when he was describing pride, I heard myself in there and the life-giving spirit in me. Because when we accept Jesus Christ, we have the life-giving spirit in us. We also have our flesh. But that life-giving spirit propelled me to go home and research about this pride. It really is the undertow of all sin, isn't it? Pride, the Bible tells us, comes before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us pride actually comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. <clears throat> well, I say pride went before the fall in the Garden of Eden. Eve allowed the serpent to whisper things about how to inflate her knowledge. Okay, did God really say? And don't you want to be as wise as God? Pride. We were branded with a P in the Garden of Eden. We all were born of flesh from Adam. <laughs> Whoo! But little did Eve and Adam know, little did many, many people know that Jesus would come and Jesus would hunt 
down those of us who have left the, the pen. He would hunt us down broken and ashamed in our pride. Even if we thought we can do it ourselves, he would still chase us down. This unraveling of pride in me, the pride of being self-reliant from the time I was 10 years old, or maybe even sooner than that, the pride that I was resourceful, that I could figure things out, the pride that I was smart, I went to school, the pride that I was right the majority of the time, the pride that there were parts of my life that I didn't want to change, pride that I didn't want to be inconvenienced, pride that now that I've come to know, this was then, the love of God, well, I knew the right way to live, You must be wondering, Julie, how long did it take you to be humbled? How long did it take you to get surrendered to the point where you say, God, I don't want my pride anymore? Let me ask you, if there's anybody in this room who struggles to be quiet because you want to be right, that is pride. If there's anybody in this room who struggles to forgive others like Christ forgave us, that is pride. And we all remember all fall short. We were all branded with that P in the Garden of Eden. And we all, hear me, we all have been forgiven. Christ died for all of us. Each and every person in this room. Christ died for Hitler. Christ died for Ted Bundy. He, he died for the person at the Walmart. It's kind of hard to wrap our brains around that. But it should be, because it is one of the greatest, most gracious, most powerful mysteries of God, what happened on the cross. Woo. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, for God bought you with a high price. I am forever and eternally grateful to the work that Christ has done in me, that he will do in me, that he will continue to do in me until I lose my last breath. And that means in here, there is no shame. Christ says there is no shame for saying, this is what I'm doing, Lord, I need your help. This is what I did, and I need your help. This is what I think about, and I need your help. There is no shame for those in Jesus Christ. And because he shows no favorites, we all are invited to his cross where change happens, where pride and every kind of sin dies. And he and we rise with new life. Paul talks about in this first chapter of um, 1 Corinthians over and over again this thought of being slaves and being free. He 
He says in 1 Corinthians 7.22, And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free. And remember I said, when I first spoke to you over here, I was now free. I was really celebrating that. I was now free. But let's hear what else in that same passage he says. And now if you are free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave to Christ. Just the way that is worded is humbling. But we who had chains that weighed us down, we can be free in him. A slave to him doesn't mean burden. A slave to Christ doesn't mean despair. It doesn't mean any of the things. Hmm. It doesn't mean sin that feels good. It doesn't mean my flesh rules. It doesn't mean those things. But how beautiful that he has invited all of us to become slaves of him. This is the message um, that he has for you today. And I know it came from him when I was doing something else. And the passage came and I had to interrupt what I was doing to write this down. If you have your one year Bible, I am going to January 25th. And if you have another Bible along, I am in Matthew 16, and I'll begin reading verse 21. I will give you a moment to get there. That's Matthew 16, 21. Whew! This, this passage begins right after Jesus is asking his disciples, Who am I? And Peter, if you remember, says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Verse 21, after he has this exchange with his disciples, it says, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, and Jesus is saying to you today, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. I need to stop there a second. Because if you're like me, you have a very mental image of what Jesus did when he picked up his cross. Right? The weight of the world upon him. And where did he go when he took up his cross? He went to Calvary. That is where we need to go when we pick up our cross. We need to go right to Calvary because Jesus says, whoo, Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. 
If I tried to hang on to what he wanted me to give up, the alcohol, the perfectionism, the, the pride, I'm not perfect, mind you, but the pride in all of its unawareness that I had, if I tried to hang on to that, I would lose my life. But if you give up your life for my sake, says Jesus, you will save it. So, when Jesus hangs on the cross and gives up his life for the sake of ours, it is what we are supposed to do when we pick up our cross and follow him to cavalry. We hang here. Crucifixion, you die because you can't get a breath. You let the parts of you that are causing sin, that are thinking sin, that are doing sin, die. And he says, I will raise you up. You let that part of yourself die, and I will raise you up to be who I intended you to be. And what does Jesus intend for us to be? Light and salt in this broken world? What does he intend for us to be? Vessels of his love, of his power, of his grace. And when we humble ourselves and say, I don't want it anymore, Lord. And if you don't know how to give it up, you ask him. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He can do anything where our limitations are so many here on this earth. So many. Get my bearings. Woo. So we become a slave to Christ, free from destructive pride, free from sinful pleasures, but a slave to Jesus. And at the risk of sounding too simple, but then the messages of heaven are simple, aren't they? He says if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give it to me, if you surrender it, I will save you. I encourage each and every one of you to take time with Jesus this week. Ask him in faith to show you where your sin is, what needs to die. Ask Jesus to make you a slave of him. And tell him, as we prayed in the beginning, tell Jesus you want to love him first. He knows you're not, but tell him you want to. Ask him for your help, his help with that. And this is the part, there's, there's so many and ors in the Bible. We are supposed to look out for each other. We are supposed to carry each other's burdens. But at the same time, we are supposed to grow ever closer to our personal Lord and Savior. So don't worry about where your husband or your sister or your friend is with Jesus. Take care of your relationship with him. 1 Corinthians 4 or 5 says, um, don't judge each other. That's more related to that pride that we got branded. Don't judge each other, Paul says, before the Lord returns. For he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. 
Then God will give to each whatever praise is due. Don't wait. The time is now to go to the cross where you are always welcome, where secrets become confessions and grace cleanses. It's amazing to me what secrets God revealed in my heart. So if you're sitting there and you don't know what to bring to him, ask him to show you because he formed you in your mother's womb. He knows every beat of your heart. He knows every tear from your eye. He knows every worry, every fear, every doubt. And he doesn't expect us to hide our doubts. When you say, Lord, I'm struggling here. I got some doubts about you. There is no shame at this cross. No shame. So you can bring anything. Because basically what his word is telling us is if we don't bring it while we're still walking and talking on this earth, his light's going to shine and it's going to come to pass anyway. But Jesus, when he died and rose again, he did that so that we could live abundantly with this joy that none of us, you know, it doesn't make sense, but this joy of knowing the Lord, this joy of trusting the Lord, this joy of the Lord that loves us. And so, walking in joy, walking in freedom from self, but slave to Christ, It's the safest place I can think of. To bring my sin. Jesus says it's the only place to bring our sin. After the service, I will be available if anybody would like me to pray with them. I just want to end by praising his name. I want to thank you, Jesus. I want us to say, can you repeat after me? We are his children. We are his children. We are his sheep. We are his sheep. We are never forgotten. We are never forgotten. And we are never in shame. We are never in shame. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! I think that concludes Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie, for that message from the Lord. And may we